All right, hey everyone, welcome to Gorge View. This is our third episode, and this one's going to be quite a bit different. I'm really excited about it. I don't even know where to begin, to be honest. But where I left you off with the Gorge Elevator, we're going to talk about practically the entire river today. And I left you off the comprehensive plan, and I know I was critiquing it, critiquing it, even though I really like the plan. And today, we're going to talk about some positive things that if you go to page 31 in the comprehensive plan and you'll see the course of division and, you know, it starts off with, imagine the year is 2030. And then mm -hmm. it goes through and all these things that have happened. Well, some of the things that have already happened in that little narrative of what the future should look like, our special guest today has accomplished quite a bit of that. So, I just want to really, well... One more thing, planning. So, you know, we talked about planning principles. And the other thing I was thinking about, particularly for this episode and this guest, is plans are bridges. Mm. You know, you, you, you come up with a plan to get from A to B and, and margin again. And at the one side, you're anchored with what are today's conditions, right? And then you build that arch over to this future that you want to be in. So plans are really important. That's another thing I like about this organization is you know, I talk strategic plans, operation plans, and tactical plans, and I see their planning as another operational plan that complements our strategic plan. But at their level, you can see it in their documents. They have what they consider their strategic plan, and then um, you can see by what they've accomplished over the years, the operational and and tactical planning. And so without further ado, I want to introduce the executive director of the Niagara Falls National Heritage Area, Sarah Belon Capen. How are you, Sarah? I'm well, Jeff. Thanks for having me today. Uh, more than welcome. So you know, I'd like to start the macro. So a lot of people probably don't know that the heritage area even exists, although they should. So mm -hmm. let's start there. What is a heritage area? So a National Heritage Area is designated by Congress. Uh, we were designated in 2008. Our management plan was approved in 2011, uh, but there's 55 National Heritage Areas around the nation. Um, one thing that people probably don't know is that Western New York has two National Heritage Areas, Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor and Niagara Falls National Heritage Area. And it's pretty significant to be designated um, as one. We fall under the National Park Service. Uh, but unlike the National Park Service, we operate in a lived-in landscape. So people are familiar with national parks, uh, Yosemite, Glacier National Park, Yellowstone, you could pick your favorite. Um, we are in that family, but we work within a lived-in landscape to preserve, protect, and promote the natural, cultural, and historic resources of an area. You guys are highly organized, and one thing that I love is your website, which is discoverniagara.org, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And we'll put the link down below in, in the YouTube channel for everyone to go connect up to that. And talk a little bit more about the history of organization, though. So you, how did it begin? Like, take me before 2008. Sure. So uh, in the early 2000s, um, and this is something that I'm not personally familiar with, I wasn't involved at that time, is that the first stage to becoming a heritage area is getting a feasibility study for a national heritage area executed. Um, and that was led early on in, uh, by uh, former Mayor Deister um, with some congressional champions, including um, former Congressional Representative Louise Slaughter, um, and then Senator Chuck Schumer. And so a feasibility study um, sends the National Park Service into a place uh, to better understand and analyze the historic significance of the place to see if it meets the criteria to become a National Heritage Area. So that happened in the early 2000s. Um, the feasibility study came back and said, yes, in fact, this meets um, that criteria that this place was so significant in history that it shaped the course of America that it deserves to be authorized as a National Heritage Area. To me, it was like a slam dunk, too easy. Um, it is, and that's, you know, one of the themes of the show is mm -hmm. we really need to appreciate what we have mm -hmm. and go out and enjoy it a lot more. You know, when I 
they appreciate what we have. I've been focused on the gorge. That's something we can all go and interact with. Just an aside, the color's amazing, guys. You have to get out there and, and go look at the gorge. I'm colorblind, and, and I can see it. It's weird to me when I take photos and put them on the screen. I see it a lot more. When I'm out there with the naked eye, I don't quite see it. But the colors are amazing. The new um, paths along the cliff top, they're really coming together. Uh, it, it looks like the paths will all be completed by the end of this month. Um, but you know, as you walk that, particularly like if I walk from my front door to the waterfalls, there's like four or five different plaques of historical significance just along that path. Mm -hmm. You know, if you walk the river down in Lewiston, Lewiston Landing, I mean, there's two different real historic significant commemorations there. Um, but uh, I digress. Going back to your website's done a good job, but it doesn't do as good of a job as the Discovery Niagara shuttle. Um, now, this is COVID year. I know it's been difficult, but... Yeah. Let's put that up front. Tell us about the shuttle. Sure. So the shuttle was actually um, part of our management plan. So that was included in the management plan um, that many commissioners sat around the table and said, this is something that's needed. It was incorporated in it. Uh, it was something then that was accepted by Congress. So the Discover Niagara shuttle started in 2016. Um, like many of our projects, it's a public-private partnership uh, so that you don't have one entity that is involved um, in providing those resources, but you have contributions from many um, that lead to a better outcome. So we started as a pilot program in 2016 with the support of many, many different partners. Um, to date, we have over 150,000 riders. Um, it's a hop-on, hop-off shuttle that goes from downtown Niagara Falls all the way to Old Fort Niagara. Uh, Pre-COVID, it was operating at 17 different stops. Um, we expanded from 14 to 17 um, in those years between 2016 and 2020. Uh, in addition to that, I think that it's really important to understand, um, and I think you touched on this earlier, Jeff, is that the connectivity. Um, we connect to the existing transportation systems that service uh, Niagara Falls and the Niagara County region, which is the NFTA route, as well as the Niagara Falls State Park Green Trolley. So we looked at it from a, a big picture um, that said, you know, what, you know, what could we do um, to make this work and how could we connect everyone to really build that regional connectivity and showcase those assets that we have from the falls to the fort. Um, the original plan, I believe, was uh, an expansion of uh, the green trolley from Niagara Falls State Park to the Power Vista when their new, vista, their new visitor center was going to be built. So they wanted to bring people back and forth. Um, and we asked the question, uh, can we do something more, right? Can we connect to those downtown um, business districts? Can we connect to the aquarium? Can we connect to the NAC, right? Um, what happens if we expanded it so that included everyone and that we got off the Robert Moses at that time, right? Um, because there's no economic activity generated when you go from a state park to a state energy, a uh, state entity on a state throughway, right? Yes. <laughs> you're, you're not getting people off to spend money or be able to even understand or appreciate uh, the fullness of our, our history here, right? And so we um, took a position that really challenged a lot of those ideas and um, force people to think a little bit bigger about it. You hit on a good point, and that's the economics. And that's something mm -hmm. like, I think I'm going to do, my second series is all going to be about the economics of tourism. But that's a very important point. You hear that locally a lot. Everyone's like, oh, these people, they come, they go in the park, and they spend all the money, and then they leave town. Um, it's not quite true. And what the shuttle does is certainly, you know, I talked, I think I mentioned in the last episode, it takes at least two days to do the gorge right. It takes three or four days to do mm. the shuttle right. Mm -hmm. um, so you're really stretching out a stay. You're providing people a reason to come. In. And it's another thing I really loved about your website. I think it does probably the best job of anything that we have to point out to someone on the other side of the world who's looking to come to Niagara Falls. I, like, I hope they land on that page because it shows them 
wow, I need, you know, my friend went there several years ago and they said, you know, it's a day trip. Mm-hmm. You know, so maybe you're going to do one overnight or maybe get in in the morning, do everything and get back on the plane that evening. Um, but this shows you, oh, wait, there's 31 points of interest on your website. Um, there are days of activity on that website. Mm-hmm. It, it, so you can really start to plan out the trip. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just got just the right amount of information on it. So 31 points of interest. Now the shuttle's only taking people to uh, roughly half of those, I think. Um, you know, I didn't do a count on that. Mm-hmm. But you got quite a bit on the upper river, um, which is, you know, another topic I want to get to eventually is, is what we underappreciate about the upper river. But share with us those points along the upper river. Sure. So, um Our heritage area, once again, the the geographic boundaries are outlined um, through Congress. So the heritage area actually goes from LaSalle all the way to Youngstown. Uh, When we started the shuttle, it made sense for many reasons to go from downtown Niagara Falls to Old Fort Niagara. Uh, But what we'd like to do in the future is certainly connect to what I call the Upper National Heritage Area, Upper River National Heritage Area segment, um, which includes uh, right above Niagara Falls. It it certainly includes the Old Stone Chimney. Um, It includes pieces of our power and industry story where the intakes are. Uh, It includes uh, where the Griffin um, was built right out in LaSalle at Griffin Park. It also includes the story of of Love Canal um, and also the community that are stretched along there that represent that power and industry story. So with the advent of hydroelectric power, uh, it came so many different industries here to Niagara Falls. And with that came the need to build some pretty unique communities like the Dakota community that's up in the upper river that was, you know, very... um, built um, almost like a cookie cutter Um, and you have these stories that are that you don't see they're not visible um, maybe to your eye um, or to my eye right away but then when you are out there driving those streets you know these homes look exactly alike and they were built to house the people who came here many of them being immigrants who worked to build the hydraulic canal which is another story um, that's in that area Um, they worked at the dean adams transformer house which we have the remaining building the last part of that plant is um, still there on buffalo avenue which is part of the national register for historic places it's a national landmark right Um, that's in certainly serious need of uh, repair, um, but that's a, an important part of our history um, that we would love the opportunity to be able to connect people to. Yeah, and, so, and you're doing a really good job of that. The periods of time, mm-hmm. right? So, now War of 1812, right? Very significant in this area, and even colonial times, very significant period of history, we play a role. Um, and then the story of the Griffin. I mean, that's like exploring the continent and finding the, mm-hmm. the Northwest Passage. Um, so much little detail and significant things. And then industry. Like, yeah, to me, you cannot understand the industrialization of America if you don't know Niagara Falls history. Um, mm. In the last episode, we really showed that by going back to 1857, and showing when they first started throwing water off the cliff from the hydro canal to boom, you've industrialized the whole cliff. Then we're back to just a power plant. And now we're back to pristine wonder. Um, and yes, that evolution exists all along, particularly upper river too. And now you still have, you know, as we deindustrialize the gorge, we industrialize the upper river. It's part of the Love Canal story also. Um, mm-hmm. But that's fading. We're in a post-industrial era and yeah. you know, it's in a living memory of locals mm-hmm. but you know particularly with when i have guests and they wonder like city seems a bit strange them. niagara falls doesn't live up to expectation you know when they mm-hmm. see obviously more infrastructure than the population suggests mm-hmm. we need uh, and that's right. why i always have to tell them the story we're an industrial city our post-industrial, we used to have 108,000 people at the height. Mm-hmm. You know, um, probably 88-ish was our, our natural because that's what you see before the construction of the new power plant and soon thereafter. But still, now we're down to 48. 
because you just don't have dozens and dozens of factories. Yeah. Um, and I think, Jeff, if I could jump in um, just real quick, and I think that's a really important point that you just made, um, is so when people are here, whether it's people from Western New York who've come to Niagara Falls or people traveling from the world to Niagara Falls, is we haven't really told that comprehensive story to answer like why, why this is, you know, not feel, right, <laughs> right? right? Like we know the stories. And I always go back to, um, what you actually started with today was just the landscape, right? Appreciation for landscape. So how I look at the work that we do is, um, and how I look at the work of a national heritage area is that it designates a landscape that is truly unique. So just talk about the rawness of the gorge, the Niagara River, 21% of the world's fresh water, yeah. Niagara Falls, right? Connecting two great lakes. So from that, you build those layers of history and when you begin to reveal those layers of history, you can tell that story that begins to make sense to the point where you have a shuttle going down Main Street with a Main Street that's mostly boarded up. And people say, well, why does it look this way? And you can say, it was built for 100,000 people. There's 48,000 people that live here today. It was built with this many people working in this many industries here. Um, but without any of that context, um, it then becomes a story that is um, hard to find, hard to understand, hard to comprehend, and people aren't left with, uh, I would say, an authentic experience of Niagara Falls because so much is missing in the story. And, it, and there's, you know, you can't really place that blame. I think that's the work that we need to continue to do is to tell all these chapters of history that took place on this landscape and so it's another thing i did in the previous episode is i was you know I, I spoke to canada and you know how shocked i was i mean the last time um i was in prior to coming back in 2013 um, the last time i was in downtown niagara falls on goat island was 1998 um dan class got married so as an aside sarah and i went to high school together <laughs> um but dan was getting married we all came down we we're in the park and i have photos with canada in the background and there's nothing there. And then in 2013, um, Labor Day weekend, I had gone up to, you know, I was looking at the building, Gorge View, and I get to the top and I saw Canada for the first time since 1998. And I was shocked. Like, what is all that? Look at all these high rise hotels. And so they've monetized their experience. So here's a way we incorporate LaSalle into the tourist experience because mm -hmm. there is quite a bit of interesting history and there is good scenic views on the upper river. Um, I mean, I don't think it's as unique um, as the gorge because there's a lot of places that do have a river flowing through them, um, but it's still beautiful and it's so mm -hmm. wide and it's, to me, you gotta interpret the natural landscape too. And you're looking at, you know, yes, 20% of the world's fresh unfrozen surface water mm -hmm flowing by your doorstep. It looks so gentle up there. Mm -hmm. Then it transition rapidly before it falls, falls into the gorge, all that, and I digress. But the economics that you're pulling people out of the park, putting them into our natural community. And the other thing is, you know, we underappreciate this and we underappreciate it in horrible ways. We tend to think like ourselves when we think about our own tourists. And when they come, they want to learn everything. Mm -hmm. right? They and different people have different interests. You know, not everyone's going to care to look at the birds. Not everyone's going to care to look at the industrial history. Not everyone's going to care to look at the colonial history. But different people are going to want to look at it. And some people are going to want to see all of it. And them getting exposed to this fact on the shuttle, right? Because it's all mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. When they go back home and they talk about their experience and they have a friend who is interested in one of these other niches, well, now they hear about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then great job because then they get to go to your website and say, yeah, this is a place worthy of me going. Mm -hmm. And that's something I talked about in the first show is how we were failing to promote ourselves. We're failing to tell our story. And Gorge Views is about getting ourselves noticed as a place of excellent views, both in, you know, visually and mm -hmm. mentally and, and, 
you know, concepts, opinions, and become a travel leader. And there's no, and thank you, because there's no organization that's doing a better job. You're really the vanguard of this effort. And I, I want people to realize that. So, best of 2019. Mm -hmm. um, looked over that. Tell us about the best of 2019. So, uh, first, I, if you, I will tell you the best of 2019, but I also just want to just touch on a couple things that you just said, if you don't mind. Um, I think that where we need to go um, to reach our full potential is that for people who are coming here and people who live here, is when they go to see the waterfalls or they go to stand by the river, that they're just not looking at that sheer wonder, um, which it is, right? But that they're able to walk away with that sense of history, that they can look at it through the lens of a freedom seeker and look at it and say, hey, this was one more river to cross before someone was able to achieve freedom who was enslaved. Or they look at it through the lens of Nikola Tesla who dreamed about this place and said, this is where I'm going to prove the AC works, the alternating current works, right? And he did. And so when you look at that waterfalls in that moment and you see it through the various lens of history, the place becomes that much more authentic and people walk away with um, an incredible experience that's transformed from that natural phenomenon um, into uh, a portal through history into that significance. And one of those is right here where we're at today, which is the portage. You know, we don't tell the story of the portage um, and the efforts it would take for first um, the Haudenosaunee to be able to go around Niagara Falls, but we're on that landmark route um, who eventually they took the explorers, which led to the Griffin, right? Mm -hmm. um, but how do you go around a falls to get to the interior of America? Well, that happened here, right? right. It's the gateway to the West. Um, and so, you know, going back to um, the conversation that uh, you had asked, I wanted to touch on that, but want to touch on about the best of 2019, um, because certainly that is representative of a lot of our work um, that we do. So we're a pretty small team, um, but I always say we take on mighty tasks. Um, so 2019 included surpassing 150,000 riders on the shuttle um, compared to 2020, um, where we've had a, almost an 86% reduction in ridership. It shows you that um, through the course of August, we had almost 2,500 people a week riding the shuttle, connecting to different places, not only people who are visiting, but people who lived here. Um, so that certainly was a highlight for us, getting um, the occupancy tax increase to support that effort was a huge, huge um, victory um, for our program and for that service to become sustainable, right? So that we can continue to build on it for the future. So that's talking about the shuttle. Um, the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center um, received a significant award, uh, award, national award for its permanent exhibition. Um, recently, we just uh, were announced that the TripAdvisor awarded the Underground Railroad Center with the Traveler's Choice Award, which is a, a really nice, I mean, talk about a vanguard, right? That's a good badge to have on your website. Right. Um, so that was through that work um, and really engaging visitors there with authentic history. Um, we started the mural project in 2019 right on Main Street um, where we had eight new murals dedicated to um, revealing people who are significant to our history that you don't see. So these uh, invisible stories, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so that public art piece, um, which I'd like to talk about for just a moment, is was really a game changer for um, the northern end of Main Street for many ways. Number one is people became engaged with the story. Number two, those were the biggest canvases, blank canvases, um, that I had seen. And, you know, there's a sense of pride and beauty now, I feel, when you enter the city or leave the city, um, if people slow down enough in that area, right, <laughs> to look at it. But the other part, too, is um, through the partnerships that we worked with on that project, we were able to get Depot Avenue paved. We were able to get new sidewalks put in that would connect to the Highland community right there. Um, no, it looks great down there. I was uh, third, I think Thursday. Thursday, I, I walked all the way to the world back, um, all above the cliff. And um, I spent a significant time right there at, at the 
Underground Railroad Center and um, yeah, um, the Bridge Over Depot Road. I went up and over there and took photos. The Underground Railroad Museum, that had to be a significant project. I mean, first, tell me about the building. Sure, so I can uh, tell you about the building, but I'll go back to um, the organizational points that you brought up in the beginning. Um, so I think one of the unique qualities of a National Heritage Area um, was that we work in partnership. So, and we try to avoid duplicate efforts. So a lot of times, as you know, we get caught in silos and you have um, entities that are working within their own silo and it'd be a lot easier if people just work together and shared resources, shared talent. Um, and so how we got involved in actually the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center is through our management plan, um, the Park Service designated the Underground Railroad being a significant interpretive theme for the National Heritage Area. But they didn't tell us to necessarily take that leadership in interpreting and building it, sorry, they said, hey, you need to work together with the State Heritage Area, which is actually the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad State Heritage Area. And so that was our approach, is we, um, I started going to meetings early in 2013 with that organization. They didn't have any people on staff at the time. Um, I was the only person on staff at the National Heritage Area. So we reached a point where we needed to add people. And so instead of doing it separately, we said, hey, why don't we have a common goal? Let's find, why don't we hire someone together? Um, and so we actually added two people over the next couple of years um, that are shared. We have shared staffing between both organizations. It not only saved resources, but we're able to match federal funds to state funds, which brings in greater leverage, right? And we're accomplishing a shared mission um, with two separate, you know, organizations, two separate boards. Um, one of those uh, significant projects that had stalled for a little bit was the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center and actually building that, um, that experience there and building what would be the first cultural attraction to open in Niagara County and in the city of Niagara Falls um, since the NAC was done. So it was approximately 37 years. Uh, and so it entirely dedicated to the story of the Underground Railroad, but through the lens of the freedom seekers themselves. So the Customs House is the original Customs House um, that was built there. So that was on the seven to save list in New York State, um, which then got incorporated into the building of the multimodal train station today um, through a Tiger Grant and it was uh, certainly preserved. What I think is one of the unique features of that preservation um, is that it operates today like it did then. You know, Border Patrol is above us, right? <laughs> it's, an international, it's an international bridge. Um, so people are crossing that border back and forth. Uh, and so, um, you know, whatever version of Border Patrol existed in the 1860s, that was who was there then, right? And you you have this arc of um, the, the past is the present, right? That is always playing out in um, the stories that we tell, but certainly also in uh, our everyday working life there. So that became the place and became home um, to uh, our ability to tell that story and be able to share the significance of that site. So when you think about that place, uh, you know, you think about it's the first place that a bridge was built to span United States and Canada, right? And how do you build a bridge in the 1850s? <laughs> with a kite. Right, with a kite. And so, you know, you want to tell that story, but you would never, you know, who would have ever guessed it would have been a kite? Um, but then you lead into this bridge that was built by, you know, John Roebling. Um, but that bridge was built with the reason to connect those countries predominantly for commerce. But then, you know, you come across the story of Harriet Tubman who crossed that bridge, right? Because it made the effort to achieve freedom that much quicker, right? Train travel did that. Um, just like the Erie Canal, and when it was built, it increased the traffic, it increased commerce. Um, so you tell that story and you can look out of the uh, custom house, out of the windows of the Heritage Center, and you can see Canada. Yeah. And it's a couple hundred yards away, maybe, right? 200? Yeah. And then you think about, yeah, you think about um, standing there as someone who escaped slavery in the South, 
maybe it's a Virginia or South Carolina or Mississippi, and you get to that point and you just have to go there. Yeah. And that final leg, and that's what happened here in Niagara Falls. And it became that central place, that hub, where so many people came and either crossed by boat, where they made the mist today, or by bridge, right at that site. And so what an incredible opportunity for us to tell that story in that original site. Uh, it's where Frederick Douglass crossed after the John Brown raid, right? Um, where he was being pursued as being um, part of that. That's how he got into Canada. Uh, and that's a story that, you know, I'm currently um, just really, really inspired by. Um, and one that we're not telling, quite frankly. Um, but that we want people who come here to be able to say, hey, yeah, what, what is this about? Absolutely. I, again, another incredible, integral role mm -hmm. in American history. And then you have a stairwell that goes down into the gorge, also. Mm -hmm. So you can interpret nature. So you know you, you have this period of history. You have the architecture of you know really three generations of, of bridging, um, and, and the nature. What yeah, it's it's. Then you go around the other side of the building. We have the murals now. Um, yeah, pretty impressive. You know what, Jeff? I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it's one of my all-time favorite spots. Um, it's almost uh, magnetic in many ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of the incredible stories that took place there. Like I said, whether it's, you know, Harriet Tubman or Frederick Douglass or Homan Walsh, who said, I'll fly that kite, right? I'll go to the, the Canadian side and, and fly that kite. Um, you know, you have all these incredible stories. You have also, that is the area where the daredevils, um, particularly the tight oh, 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 rockers prior to Nick Walenda, that's where they walked and the spectators would line the suspension bridge. Um, and you have the incredible story of, uh, I think it's Maria Bettoloni. No, and I might get her last name right, so you'll have to excuse me for that. But she walked across several different times um, in one day. And one of her last images was walking across on a tightrope with, you know, peach bushel baskets on her feet, right? And <laughs> it's Feltorini. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. And yeah, Maria Speltorini. Um, and so, and then you have class six rapids, right? Like the powerhouse, the Himalayas, the title of the Himalayas. Um, and you can go down and you can listen to those and you can experience in those and you can see how close you are to Canada. Um, and you have this incredible, magical view of Niagara Falls um, all seasons, right? Yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite views, actually, even though I it's so far back, but that's what I like about it. Like, yeah. yeah. I like to pretend, I'm, once I get down to the bottom stairwell and deep into the gorge, you know, yeah. I just, because uh, I'm a kid, I just imagine I'm an early explorer or, you know, I'm a... Indian who's first venturing up this river and you hear, you know, one, there's no way you hear the falls there because the rapids are so loud. Mm -hmm. you know? But you're like, where's this going next? And then, you know, you peek through the trees and up the river and you see, what is that? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Can you imagine? Or, or imagine being the daredevil who shot the falls in the barrel, or shot the rapids in the barrel, right? Who, there are several of them that did that, right? Who's just gotten the barrel and said, well, I'm going to shoot the rapids. Or, <laughs> or the, you know, he can certainly Matthew Webb, who yeah, is in the him. daredevil place, who, you know, tried to attempt to swim it. The first person to swim the English Channel, he came over here, he tried to swim the cemetery. rapids. Yes, he's buried in Oakwood Cemetery, another special place that I'd love to talk about at some point. Um, but yeah, that you would have just been like, yep, I'm going to jump in this and I'm going to swim across, right? Um, <laughs> and I think that you can put yourselves, if you know those stories, like you do, yeah. right? You can put yourself in any of those shoes. And I think that that's the incredible power of this place overall is that it lends to imagination. And all these stories are connected to someone who had the imagination, was inspired by this place either to create electricity to you know shoot a barrel down those rapids to swim across the rapids to walk a tight rope across the rapids, or to achieve freedom yeah. right or to help someone achieve freedom i mean i get goosebumps when i think about that right like you and those you know those stories i know those stories but my dream is to make sure everyone knows all those stories and can find their place in that story 
just like I can find my place in, you know, the story of Maria Spatolini, right? Um, because that's the balance of life is yeah. you've walked across a tight road six times. Now do it with, you know, peach bushel baskets <laughs> 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 or carrying your sister on your shoulders, right? Yeah, continue the challenge yourself. So. <laughs> um, this has been great. We're going to have to have you back. Um, I think so. Because you have a thousand more stories to tell, <laughs> a lot more details. And there's so many things as you're talking. I want to hit on those, but you know, I don't want to break your stride. So that's awesome. Um, so thank you for coming in. Yeah. Everyone, hit subscribe on YouTube. Share this video with the world because that's what we're trying to mm -hmm. do is share this these stories. And obviously, this is a much more exciting episode. And we're going to have more in the future. Um, and so... Sarah, thanks for being our first guest. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. The beginning. I'll be something.